Good morning. Welcome to Wilson Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have you here with us this morning. Hope you have a sense of the grace and peace of this place. Um, do take note in our bulletin of any announcements going on. One particular, um, we are having our church family night supper this evening at 5 o'clock. I hope you'll put that on your calendar. Best food in, the best church food in town. <laughs> best church food in the country, if you want to... <laughs> That outshines many, 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 many restaurants outside of Williston. <laughs> Hope you'll come. I even hear tonight there's a magic show. So, should be good. And the food will be delicious. Um, in fact, uh, um, the good news is we are having the supper tonight, and I don't suppose we're going to take off the summer because it just gets too hot in the evenings as summer goes on, and so uh, we will, uh, just like last year, uh, bring back the family night suppers in September. So anyway, um, and that's part of our summer schedule. Uh, we'll come now to our special bulletin. Ah, uh, tell us your name. Sure will, sure will. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this Memorial Day, we are grateful for those who, as President Lincoln said, gave the last full measure of devotion to this country. Help us as citizens to honor them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We now like to invite forward my good friend Andrea, who has a minute for mission for us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Launched in 1922 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Women's Auxiliary in the Presbyterian Church in the United States, the birthday offering is a time-honored annual tradition for Presbyterian women. Over the last century, these grants have funded more than 200 major projects that continue to give medical care, education, shelter, food, and support for people most in need at home and abroad. PW honors this legacy by celebrating women's giving today and looking forward to the future. By providing grants to projects like Bethel Hills and Cafe Ginkgo, Presbyterian Women continues to faithfully serve our neighbors, support inclusive communities, and witness to the promise of God's never-ending work in the world. Advocates for community choice doing business as Bethel Hills Villa 5 Apartments and Recreation Area in Marthasville, Missouri will receive $123,500. Bethel Hills provides a safe and loving place that takes into consideration the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. A villa will be renovated into four accessible apartments for eight individuals. The housing will take into consideration the specific needs of the residents, such as acute sensitivity to sounds, bright lights, and certain colors. The new recreational area will offer space for art and music therapy, as well as other leisure activities. Cafe Ginkgo was started by the congregation of the Shawnee Presbyterian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Located in an economically disadvantaged area where single mothers and children face challenges of food insecurity, the church started addressing this need in August 2019 by serving free dine-in meals. On average, 30 meals were served at Cafe Ginkgo each Monday. However, in 2020, the pandemic put a stop to the program. With the birthday offering grant of $150,000, Cafe Ginkgo will be able to reopen with a renovated kitchen and expanded capacity to provide meals. Improvements to the fellowship hall will allow the church to offer enriching activities such as tutoring for elementary ages, a play area, financial literacy classes, and parenting workshops. As always, donations may be made with cash or a check made out to Williston Presbyterian Church, earmarked for PW. You know by now that when I stand before you, I'm probably going to ask you to open your wallets. 
Your generosity is unfailing, and I once again thank you so much for your support of these offerings. And thank you, Andrea. If you've been uh, listening in the Wilson community for the past month, we've been hearing a beautiful sound of bells, our carillion. And today's our day of dedication for that. And to, and to get start things off, I'd like to bring, uh, invite forward my, my dear friend Mark for a couple words. Today, <clears throat> Pastor Doug will lead us in a dedication to what you just heard. In the South, we say Carillion, but the proper pronunciation is Carolines. <laughs> so, so, however you may say. <laughs> um, the purchase of this Caroline was made possible by gifts from Mr. and Mrs. Harry O. Weeks, better known as Spooky. Thank you. Um, the affili affiliation of the Weeks in this church is through the friendship of Tommy and Mary Kay Burton and their family. Mary Kay went to work for Spooky in 1991, and she and Tommy and their family became good friends, and they still work together at Hudson Etheridge Companies in Aiken today. It was through their friendship that led Mr. Weeks to gift the Williston Presbyterian Church donations throughout the years. Thank you. Mr. Weeks, and may God bless you and your family for your thoughtfulness. Today we dedicate this instrument to the glory of God in yours and Miss Fran's honor. Sir, we certainly agree on one thing. We both love this lady right here. So, and... Uh, so grateful for you. Let us now rise to dedicate our bells. All things come from God. Prosper the work of our hands. Show your servants your works. Almighty God, we thank you that you have put into the hearts of your people to make offerings for your service and have been pleased to accept their gifts. Be with us now and bless us as we set apart this carillion to your praise and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For the gift of music, for melodies that echo the harmonies of heaven, for voices transcending time and space, United in the glory of your name. We give you thanks, o Lord. Moved by the Holy Spirit, our guide in all truth and beauty. We this o Lord, before whose throne trumpets sound and saints and angels sing the songs of Moses and the Lamb, accept this carillion for the worship of your temple, that with the voice of music we may proclaim within this community your praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Let us now have the choral call to worship. Let us now say together our call to worship. Holy, holy, holy is our God. The glory of God thunders. No one knows from where it comes or where it goes. Will we hear that song saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Let us worship God in holy splendor.
Amen. I must sound, you sounded great without him. Let us now together pray our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, you tell us that we are your children, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Let us not take our inheritance for granted or hold too tightly to our understanding of who we are. For you are wild like the wind, loving whom you choose with reckless generosity. You call us to abandon fear, to receive a new family made up of all people and all creation. Teach us to love as you love wild and free, through Jesus Christ our, our Lord. This statement is completely true. Our Lord and Savior Christ came to, came to save sinners, sinners just like me, and sinners just like you. He personally bore with his body on the cross our sin, so that we might be dead to sin, and alive to all that's fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to do a little ritual for those that have not seen what we're doing here before. We're taking up a children's change offering. We call it a bunny money offering because we used to have this big container and it had a bunny that covered it up and hid it away, thanks to Miss Millie that uh, made that bunny for us. And, and we, we've got to drag that thing out of storage. We've actually got it under security now, but anyway, it's a neat thing. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of the guy Ray Stevens? You know the Ray Stevens song? And, and I, you know, do you ever have those morning, mornings you wake up and not that it's necessarily a Ray Stevens song, but you just get a song running in your head and, you, and it stays there all day long? Yeah. Well, and I'm not going to do the day the squirrel went berserk. And, <laughs> in the first church. I'm not going to do that. But I was thinking about that song he had. It was, let me tell you about Ahab, the Arab, the Sheik of the Burning Sand. Remember that one? Yeah. Had emeralds, rubies. Well, anyway, I'm not even talking about that Ahab, but I am going to talk about an Ahab, King Ahab. And this king, he lived in kind of the Samaria region, as I understand it, just kind of south uh, east of Jericho, I guess it would be. And anyway, and he was kind of a, he was kind of a rough character. And uh, there was a, a prophet, God's chosen prophet at the time, was Elijah. And they kind of, they kind of butted heads on, on several occasions and everything. And uh, there was Elijah who obeyed the commandments or, or you know, he, he followed God's plan for him. And, of course, Ahab had a whole different idea about the way that religion should go. And so he told King Ahab, he said, you know, there's going to be a drought. In fact, it's not going to rain again until I say it rains. There won't even be any morning dew. It's going to be really, really dry around here. And so, and so it was. And so then God told uh, Elijah, he said, you better just kind of get out of this region, you know, kind of get out of Dodge, so to speak. So he went to a, a place, and it was kind of a brook, or really it's more like a river, a stream, big divide of water. It was called Kareth. In fact, the Hebrew word 
uh, for divide or cutting, if you will, is Kareth. So he, he told him, he said, you just camp out in that region and I'm going to provide for you. And he sent these uh, blackbirds or ravens to every morning and they would, they would bring him meat to eat. Wow. I mean, and ravens, if you, you know, they're kind of like dolphins or they're kind of like elephants. They're, they're smart animals. And so as God commanded, these birds provided um, Elijah with food. So uh, that being said, so there he was out there provided for. Now, what's the whole takeaway of this thing from Ray Stevens on down? Okay, the, the whole idea here is that God provides for those that uh, obey him. And, and follow his commandments. And so, um, now, it, it's, it's not that Elijah, you know, could, that God sent him to a restaurant, or he provided one of those edible arrangements for him and everything, charcuterie board, you know, and one of these big spreads like Allison put on for Reese uh, the other night. But, um, yeah, but God provides for us when we need it, and, and when we need it the most. Let's think about that. Let's pray about that. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this week, even though it's just been so busy and excited and with so much going on. And sometimes it just seems like that little, that little river careth is just kind of cutting or dividing us and just keeping from doing things and, and even just, just taking us a, apart from you. But we ask that you go with us and you be with us, and you lead us, and you guide us, and you teach us, and remind us that you're always there meeting our needs, and all we need to do is ask. In your name we pray. Amen.
We now come to our time of prayer. And as always, I'd ask you, do you have any prayer requests? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? What's that? Okay. Okay, just a second. Uh, what was the last name? Dunaway? Okay. Beth. See, I said, I wrote down Bev. See, I got to. Okay. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you not alone, nor for just ourselves. In each of us, dear Lord, there are memories and reminders of an innumerable company whose lives have entered into our lives and with whom we have shared the mystery and the wonder of these earthly years. Bound even in hatred and misunderstanding to some who knew us better than we know ourselves. We have also been bound by love and understanding to many whose knowledge of us was forgiveness and kindness and their forgiveness, faith. Therefore, as we seek you, who art the loving God of us all, we seek that blessing which shall be a blessing for us all. Dear Lord, you know the secret circle within the intimate walls of each of our hearts. All of those whom you have bound together with us in this bundle of life and tapestry of our life's journey. Help us, we pray that we would always remember who we serve as we remember and deal with them. This day, we do remember our servicemen who, for the life and history of this country, have sacrificed themselves so that we might be free. Help us, O oh God in their honor to be citizens worthy of their sacrifice. We also pray for those in our community in midst, midst. We pray for Sandra and her family. We pray for the Elkins family who lost Kim. We pray you be with Fran Weeks Bless and keep her. It's never an easy thing to face heart surgery, O oh God, or knee surgery. And so we pray you be with Beth. And may she know your presence and your love. O oh God, we take all these prayers and we present them before your throne of grace. And we remember the prayer that Jesus prayed when he prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holidays like Mother's Day and Memorial Day always leave us pastors with a conundrum. Do we go with the holiday, which is a bit secular in nature, which, or do we go with the regular lectionary text, which may not have anything to do with the holiday? I have to confess to you, in my few years, <laughs> in my years of the ministry, I've been sort of 50-50 on specific holidays. This year I'm on the side of going with Memorial Day. And so with that in mind, I'm going to take as our text First Kings from the Old Testament. Uh, it's a continuation of the story of Elijah that Bob shared with us earlier. It's from the 18th chapter, the 16th through the 21st verses. But before we turn to the scripture and the sermon, let us turn to God in prayer. Eternal God, we pray that your spirit would descend upon this place with power and that your word would be delivered with full assurance through the Holy Spirit and in the strong name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. As I say, our text comes from the book of Kings, the first book, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. I take this from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Let us now reverently attend to the reading of God's holy word. This is as Elijah comes to the court of Ahab. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab the king saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, It is you, you troubler of Israel. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, king, and your father's house, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore have all Israel assemble for me at Mount Carmel, with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The northern kingdom of Israel in 800 BC was going through a crisis of identity and just who they were and who they followed. For years they had been under Ahab who has been considered one of the worst kings in the history of Israel. But even more so, his wife was the evil queen Jezebel. That's one thing, I, I don't see many young ladies named Jezebel. <laughs> as we go through life. Well, Ahab has been tormented by Elijah the prophet, and so we come to sort of a climax, a point of things today. A Elijah comes to Ahab, and Ahab goes to meet him, and you heard the text, oh, you troubler of Israel. He's hated by the king. In the spirit of, I should say, John the Baptist was in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah looks pointedly at the king and says, I'm not the disturber of Israel, but you are. And he calls for a national meeting. At the meeting, he calls for the people. And he calls for all the prophets, 400 of Baal that could be gathered, and Ashtaroth, who was Jezebel's favorite deity. You have to understand uh, the people under the influence of Ahab and Jezebel had forgotten much about their past, about who they were, about who they worship. You see, the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth was a lot of fun. 
not a lot of sacrifice. And so it was becoming more and more popular, particularly under these two rulers. So there, today, you can see it if you go to the port of Haifa. Towering above Haifa is Mount Carmel. He calls for the meeting. And he talks to the people. He gives a succinct, powerful, short speech. How long are you going to go limping with two decisions? As Jesus would say later, a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. Folks, if God, if Jehovah is God, then follow him. But if you believe Baal or Ashtaroth is God, then you follow that deity. You can see the confusion at this point. The, how the people's hearts were, didn't know where they are. You can see the depth of the national crisis. In the powerful words of the end of the text where I read, and the people didn't say a word. Well, you probably, if you went to Sunday school through the years, you probably know the rest of the story. How the prophets of Baal, Elijah taunts them to make a sacrifice and to accept the sacrifice and it isn't accepted. And it's Elijah who, after he pours water on the wood and lights it up and remarkably is accepted that all of a sudden the people say, the Lord is God, Jehovah's God. We will follow him. But they were a people who had forgotten who they were. They had lost a sense of themselves. You know, Roy Disney, of all people, he was a good guy, by the way, Roy Disney, he made this point. He said, if your values are clear, choices are easy. If you can remember who you are and who you serve and what's in here, then the choice is pretty clear. Remember who you are. Now, some of the younger folks among us will say he's quoting from The Lion King. Remember that famous scene in The Lion King where Simba's gone off and trying to avoid that he's the heir to the king? He's afraid because because he's afraid people will blame him for his father's death, that he couldn't go back, and he has that visitation from his father miraculously, and the king thunders from the clouds, remember who you are, as he goes back. Well, for me, that statement's a little more personal. See, there was a young college student who was living at home at the time, he'll be nameless, and I was planning to go out, I was, had a chip on my shoulders, sort of resented living at home at the time, but I needed to financially. And I told my, oh, excuse me, that person <laughs> <laughs> told my mom and dad that I was going out, taking my car. By the way, I'm not going to forgive my father. He bought my first car. You know what it was? A Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> And then he laughed as I tried to fit into it. And, but that doesn't matter. My mom asked me, son, when do you plan to come home? In a very innocent, nice way. Nothing untoward in that statement. And I answered her, like I said, I was rebellious, had a chip on my shoulder. I'll be home before sunrise. My father hard-bitten Presbyterian elder, World War II veteran, looked at me with a glance that only he could give, and he said, Son, remember who you are. I came home by 11 o'clock. <laughs> remember who you are. That's a good thing for us to ask on Memorial Day weekend, isn't it? Not only as our duties as citizens, but as followers of Jesus Christ. 
appropriate question on this day when we honor those who have fallen. I read an amazing story this week about a West Point graduate who graduated to Bow seven or eight years ago. His name was Alex Legat. He was an immigrant. His father was an immigrant who was a refugee from Haiti. He had eight children. He worked hard to put all his children through school. Alex went to class and became a naturalized citizen. He volunteered for the Army. He served two years in the National Guard. And he had such an exemplary record that the congressperson from his state nominated him, nominated him to West Point. He returned that faith in that congressperson by finishing near the top of his class, capturing the prize in physics. He volunteered to become an Army combat helicopter pilot. You can look at Google his graduation picture. And you see, as he looks up at the flag at his fellow cadets, the tears streaming down his face in gratitude for the choices not only that he made, that his father made. It was clear that he remembered who he was. By the way, he's still alive today. But you know what one of his first missions was? a rescue operation to help people in Haiti, refugees. If you know your values, your choices then become clear. I can't think of about the choices made by a select group of young people, average age 22 in the Army. They volunteer. Only 3% are accepted, by the way. It's the 3rd Infantry Regiment, the oldest serving regiment in the history of the United States. It goes back to 1986. For the last 90 years, they've been known as the Old Guard. If you go to the tomb of the unknown soldier, it's the Old Guard, the people from the 3rd Regiment, young men and women who march before the tomb. You might think they do that for easy duty. After all, they get to live in Washington, D.C., have all, all sorts of fun, do all those kind of things. Not until you hear what they have to go through. Only 3% are accepted. You know, one of the reasons why maybe it's so strict, they take a vow. The members of the 3rd Infantry Regiment take a vow. The old guard take a vow. They're 22 years old, most of them. They take a vow that they will not curse, they will not drink, and they will do nothing to dishonor the folks they march in front of in the tomb of the unknown soldier. You think, oh, that's okay, you know, they can live it up when their enlistment's over. They can go back to having fun. It's a vow for life. It's demanded of them that if they are going to honor those they march in front of, they take that vow for life. Did you know that? Next time you see those folks marching? Anyway, they march back and forth. But there's meaning to that. That's appropriate to know on this Memorial Day weekend, even in a sermon. They start here. And they march exactly 21 steps to the next place. They stop for exactly 21 seconds. And they march back to the next place. 21 steps. Perhaps you figured it out. 21 is to symbolize a 21-gun salute. The highest honor that you can give a person. They are called to do that march in rain, sleet, freezing weather, hot weather in full uniform, no matter what. 
And don't think that in two in the morning when the park closes down that they stop. It's well known that the old guard, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, marches. And they'll tell you, they interviewed them, they realize that they do that not only to honor those behind them, but the reason why they take that vow is they know they're marching for the thousands of folks who gave their life in Arlington Cemetery. Not only those, but to those who gave their life at Marlboro Cemetery in Holland, in Normandy, in the Punch Bowl, in Honolulu, in thousands of cemeteries across their nation. They believe that that is who they honor. And to miss a step, to all of a sudden quit in the cold, is to dishonor and to break their vow. We as citizens would be good to remember that. But we also remember that we're called to serve. That a disciple of Christ is called, if need be, to give the last full measure of devotion for who we serve. This day, as we remember those who've fallen, who gave us the right to be here in this place, the right to vote freely, the right for free assembly, the right for a trial by jury, the right for free for religion. Let us remember that we are called to serve our Lord 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That when you, to the best of your ability, make that decision to follow Christ, it's not a four year recruitment. And then you get to say, time to leave. Not a bad vow, that. I will live my life not using profanity, getting drunk, or doing anything that would dishonor the Lord and Savior I serve. May we as Christians take and heed the sacrifice and example of a bunch of 22-year-old kids and a Haitian helicopter pilot as we live our own lives. You know, the one big difference, we are real big on tombs too. Just as Washington has the tomb of the unknown soldier, we have a tomb in Jerusalem. We're not quite sure where it is. There's some theories. But you know what? There's no guard in front of that tomb. There's no one marching. But you know what? We don't need to. Because that tomb is empty. So we can live. And we can serve him. Maybe our vow should be, I've quoted to you before, the great verse from Isaac Watts. Were the whole realm of nature mine, O Christ, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, demands my soul, demands my all. That's what it means to honor Christ. To live for him to the best of our ability and if we have to, to be willing to sacrifice for his sake. You know, in closing, when a member of the old guard is going to be relieved, 
the one who relieves them says, post and orders. The one who is going to take over says, order received. I will carry on. I close with these words of Christ. He says, you know what your post and orders are? As you live here in Williston and Barnwell and throughout this area, go ye therefore into the world and proclaim the gospel. Live and dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ. Because Roy Disney is right, dear friends. If you know your, who you are and know your values, choices are even, easy. And by the way, one more thing. You know the secret to the old guard's success, why they're so well loved? Leonard Bernstein got it right. One time he was asked what was the most important instrument and the hardest instrument to play in the orchestra. You know what he answered? Second fiddle. It's more difficult not to be the star, to be the second fiddle. And isn't that appropriate? Those young men are playing a beautiful second fiddle to those veterans who gave themselves. And we, as followers of Christ, who were called to love one another and called to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love our enemies, aren't we called to be wonderful second fiddles for Jesus Christ, dedicating ourselves to him? Well, I can say what I want because the Constitution gave me the freedom to. So I say, God bless the United States. God bless the old guard. God bless that young man from Haiti. God bless all those who serve. And may we, as followers of Christ, not forget what they do, and may it have impact on our own lives. Thank you for listening to me. Amen. Let us now rise and reaffirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. May the ushers come forward.
Gracious God, we are thankful for these gifts, for the hands that gave them, and we're grateful for this church. Help us to stand for Christ in this place. This we ask in your name. Amen. now may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. May the sunshine warm upon your faces and the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you. May God hold you in the hollow of his hands. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>